So here are the headlines again. To better illustrate the bias that is in these headlines, let's pretend that Picasso's Le Demoiselle de Avignon, and my French is terrible, so sorry about that. Uh, this, was, this came in second place in the survey. Um, now let, let's, let's make the equivalency and pretend that this came in first place. Would we have seen these headlines? But maybe the pomposity of modern art brings out the indignity, the, every, the, whatever, the indignity of the news media. Uh, so let's look at another example, um, the World Toilet Summit. Every year, the World Toilet Summit convenes to address global health issues and draw attention to the implication of toilets on the health of, human, of humanity. Um, they talk about cholera outbreaks in the third world. They talk about crime in public toilets. They talk about sludge dumping. Uh, they talk about the fact that diarrhea kills 12,600 children in Asia, Africa, uh, and South America every single day. This, this isn't a trivial conference, um, but this is the kind of media coverage it generates. That's clever. <laughs> oh, also clever. I don't know what that was. Um, and also clever. So you're seeing here the linguistic, contextual, and professional cues that the news media uses so that the subject does not contaminate the context. Um, linguistic is clear. They, they're making puns on flushes and things like that. Uh, contextual is, if we go back to one before, you see this is on the offbeat section. Um, I, I've never seen an AIDS conference in offbeat, but this is pretty clearly as significant. Um, and then finally, given everything I've told you about what this conference studies and talks about, is uh, flushing out smelly toilets really the most salient fact to be communicated in the headline? Um, so that's, that's the kind of professionalism that, that takes backseat to communicating judgment. Um, this isn't because they want to distinguish their poop reporting. Uh, this is what this is because they want to distinguish their poop reporting from their other subjects. They don't hate poop, there's not a conspiracy against poop, but rather they don't want poop to contaminate your view of their foreign affairs reporting and their sports and their local and their politics. Uh, they want to make sure this contamination doesn't spread and these are the techniques they use. But if poop makes them so uncomfortable, why are they reporting on it at all? And this goes back to the contradiction that we discussed before that uh, despite the fact that who clearly makes them uncomfortable, they actually end up reporting on it all the time. And the reasons for this, and they often elevate poop-related stories, and they often treat poop in a story as the most important fact in the story, whether it is or not. Uh, and that's because of the role in poop in our culture. Poop is the most negative thing there is. And if you are writing a story and you have the most extreme negative in the story, you're going to have a tendency to treat that as the most important fact of the story. Uh, and this. This tendency makes its way to the highest levels. For instance, there's this report from the New York Times, uh, a 1.4 billion deal for bus stop toilets. Now, if you read the first headline, the first uh, line, 3,500 bus stop shelters, 30, 330 newsstands, and 20 public toilets. Hmm. Public toilets is not the most important fact of this story, but they elevate it because of this tendency. Um, here's another one. Two women in South Carolina got in a fight over toilet paper, and somehow this is news in San Francisco where the story appeared. Uh, of course, this tendency makes the media easily exploitable. For instance, the World Toilet Summit would not get nearly as much press coverage if it was a World Summit on Sanitary Health, and they know that, and they use that. Uh, similarly, uh, the, whole, the whole country would not have known about the First Church of God in Pendleton, Oregon, which was selling toilet paper to raise money. That was CBS Nationwide News. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about the role of professionalism uh, when it comes to media and the poop. Um, the best example uh, in which the media abandons professionalism in the face of poop uh, comes from Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, from a story in 2004. And until the recent Aqua Teen Hunger Force thing in Boston uh, last month, this was probably the best example of the absurdity of our American terror paranoia. Um, in Erie, in June 2004, an 18-year-old guy named Troy Musel had an accident in his pants which is something that happens to the best of us, except for me. Um, so he made a couple of mistakes. The first mistake he made is he took his pants and he just put them in a plastic bag because he was at a friend's house, and he threw the bag over a fence. Uh, mistake number one was on the other side of the fence was the Sigsby Reservoir from where Erie draws its drinking water. Um, and the second mistake was that he left his keys in his pockets. <laughs> so the next day when he realizes he um, 
climbs the fence to get his pants back so he can get his keys, and someone sees him and says, oh my god, there's Al-Qaeda right there, and they call the cops, and they call the FBI and the bomb squad, and he's arrested, and there's a whole media frenzy around it, uh, and for a couple days, the media really got a lot of mileage out of this story. Um, Fox talked about it nationwide, uh, CBS News talked about it nationwide, um, and of course, it was all over the Erie Times News for a couple days. Um, the coverage was as widespread as Seattle and Toronto, and even made uh, Keith Olbermann's show on MSNBC. Um, but with, very, with one exception that came four months after the fact um, in actually a local New York paper, there was no follow-ups to the story. Um, but I followed up on the story. I spoke to Troy, and here's what he told me. Um, he was fired from his job because his boss did not like the FBI coming around asking questions. He was originally charged with defiant trespass and was supposed to expected to have a $300 fine. Uh, but the judge upped the charge to criminal trespass uh, so he could fine Troy $5,000 to cover the costs of the city's response. Now, how many criminals, uh, when they're arrested, are forced to pay for the police response? Or trespassers are supposed to pay for the police response? No one really went into what made this story different uh, in the eyes of the law. Uh, and since, of course, he lost his job, he had no money, so he couldn't pay the fine, so he ended up spending some time in jail. Um, he didn't have a lawyer. They never gave him a lawyer. He was not appointed a lawyer. That's the Sixth Amendment. Um, he, he didn't seem to know he was entitled to a lawyer, but no one bothered to tell him he was entitled to a lawyer. So that was that for him. Uh, and no one questioned the response of the police and the bomb squad and the FBI. Um, if you compare that to uh, the media's, uh, how they handled the Aqua Teen Hunger Force thing, there are plenty of follow-ups and plenty of analysis. Um, it's a very similar story in terms of the absurdity of it but the media reaction is completely different. Now, in spite of everything that I've talked about in this presentation, there are times when the media does treat poop seriously, uh, and that's when the subject poses no danger of contaminating the context, and that's in stories like this. There are no puns here. It is not in the weird news section, and the facts are reported just as they would um, in any other story. Here's a couple more. And one more. Now these stories may have been given more weight due to the presence of poop in the story, uh, but there are no puns, there are no dismissive context, there's no need for the media to articulate its opinion of the subject. Because when there's no ambiguity about where contamination lies, the media doesn't need to provide any further cues. From the news media perspective then, this, a rapist who eats his own feces, is not matter out of place. It is, in fact, matter that's very much in its place because contamination is very clearly assigned. When matter is out of place, when it becomes ambiguous, like uh, the first waterless urinal in Frederick County, uh, then the news media needs to articulate its position. Um, if the audience will agree where contamination lies, then the news media does not need to worry about deflecting contamination. So, but if there's any doubt as to where contamination lies, the media will go to great lengths to deflect the contamination, even if it means abandoning it. So, uh, and this is going to talk a little bit about what Mari just talked about. Um, consider that the toilet and the sewers are based on a 19th century infrastructure that's fairly archaic. Um, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that you're an inventor and you recognize the fact that we flush 108 million pounds of potentially viable fertilizer down the toilet every day, um, and on the other side of the cycle, replace that with 65 million pounds of nitrogen fertilizer applied to the land by farmers every single day. Um, or let's say you recognize that we flush 32 billion, uh, 32 billion gallons of water down the toilet every day uh, into a $250 billion infrastructure designed simply to recover the water we flush down in the first place. Uh, if you have a better idea, you're going to need to come up with public support. And that means managing the news media. You need the media working with you. Um, so that's why we study the media's tendencies, so we can figure out how to change the world, even if the way we change the world does involve poop. Um, and the difference between this kind of stuff is the difference between this kind of coverage, which is uh, this guy invented a water purifier, the guy who invented the Segway. Very favorable coverage uh, in Time magazine. Um, it's a difference between this kind of coverage um, and this kind of coverage. <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs>